The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Emotional Considerations for Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Families During COVID-19 and Beyond. Today's webinar is hosted by the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. My name is Cindy Andrake, and I am the Family Support Manager here at CCF. If you're new to our webinars, we want to extend a warm welcome to you. But if, and if you've joined us previously, we want to welcome you back, and we're glad that you can join us. Before I introduce you to our presenter, I'd like to review some housekeeping information. If at any time during the presentation you have technical issues, please type your concerns into the chat window on your control panel and we'll do our best to address them. If you should have any audio issues or difficulty hearing, you should be able to switch from your computer screen to a call-in phone number to correct the audio. In order to provide the highest quality webinar session and to avoid any background noise, all attendees, will be in the listen-only mode during this presentation. Questions are encouraged during the presentation and we will reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour to answer your questions. So please submit your questions via the question box located on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. I will read them to our presenter at the conclusion of the presentation. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing the screen at any point, you can hide it by clicking the small orange arrow at the top left of the control panel. Last, uh, we are recording today's presentation and we'll post it on CCF's YouTube channel called CCF Heart Kids for anyone that would like um, access to the recording at a later time. So with all of our housekeeping reminders complete, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Lefkowitz. Dr. Deborah Lefkowitz is a pediatric psychologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an assistant professor of clinical psychology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She has worked with children with cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and transplant for almost 20 years. She is currently the manager of psychosocial services for the Transplant Center at CHOP and the clinical director of the Pediatric Health and Behavior Program. Dr. Lefkowitz is a former council member of the International Pediatric Transplant Association and has published and presented nationally and internationally about coping with chronic illness, psychological aspects of organ failure and transplantation, and pediatric transplant ethics. Thank you, Dr. Lefkowitz, for being with us this evening. We're really looking forward to your presentation. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Lefkowitz. Thank you so much, Cindy, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm really glad to have this opportunity. Um, I want to just get this to work. I'm having trouble getting the slide to advance. Um, you, can you oh, there just... we go. Okay, now it's working. Okay. okay. Um, I just want to acknowledge that this is a universally stressful time for everyone. Um, but also with the recognition of the unique additional stress associated with having a child with a medical illness during this time. And we're going to talk a good bit about that later, um, but I just wanted to start by putting that out there. Um, what we will talk about today is first you know, what we know in general about psychological functioning of kids with cardiomyopathy. Um, second, what affects how people cope with chronic illness um, in regular times outside of COVID-19. And then third, how can you as a parent cope with the stress of COVID-19? And then lastly, how can you best support your child during this time and beyond? So first, I wanna review what we already know from research about psychological functioning in children with cardiomyopathy. Spoiler alert, not that much. So very few studies have looked at the psychological impact of cardiomyopathy on children. And part of, that's partially because it's just a very rare disease, so it's not as easy to conduct research and the kids with cardiomyopathy often get mixed into larger studies about children with other heart diseases, and there are likely important differences in those populations. So it's really hard to what we call extrapolate or take generalized information from a few studies. But the few studies that we have seen have told us a few things. Um, one, the, the few studies have suggested that there are, there are higher rates of anxiety and depression and somatic symptoms, which are like aches and pains in your body, um, but lower rates of behavioral problems in children with cardiomyopathy than in the healthy population. Um, we also know that parents tend to rate their child's quality of life. So quality of life is a sort of a weird thing, but they describe it kind of as just sort of how parents feel that kids are doing in general. So they typically describe their child's quality of life as being a lot lower than their children themselves rate it. So essentially kids think that they're doing better than parents think that they're doing. Parents also report having a pretty hard time themselves. 
Um, and despite all of that, most kids with cardiomyopathy do not have anxiety, depression, or other psychological concerns. That even though these ki our kids are at higher risk than the general population, most of them are actually doing very well. Because there's such little research, what we tend to do is that we need to look at the literature in general, family and child coping with illness to, to try and get some more information about what kinds of kids and families do well in the face of illness and what kinds of kids and families may have more trouble. So there's a fairly large body of research across different illness groups. So there are a number of factors that can predict how a child and a family might cope with a chronic illness. It doesn't tell us information about in a, any individual child or family, but just gives us broad information about some of the things we might expect in a population. So the first one is disease characteristics. We tend to think that kids with the worst illness have the hardest time adjusting. So we'd expect someone with a really severe illness to be the most at risk for anxiety, depression, other difficulty coping. And it turns out that that just really isn't true. There's a very low correlation between how sick somebody is and how we'd expect them to be coping. Um, instead, what does seem to make a big difference about a particular disease is factors, re other factors related to it. So for example, unpredictability is a big one of them, um, which I know is something that is a hallmark in, cardi in cardiomyopathy. Um, so how predictable or not the disease is, how often somebody experiences the symptoms, um, these are the variability and the types of symptoms they experience. Those factors related to the illness are much more predictive of somebody's distress than the severity of the illness itself. The second one is functional independence. And essentially what that means is that an illness that impacts a child's ability to be able to do what other kids their age can do. So kids who, because of their illness, are not able to do the things that they would want to do that other kids their age can do tend to have a little bit of a harder time coping, which makes a lot of sense. The next one is the level of psychosocial stress from the illness. So what's been discovered is that um, diseases that have a high level of daily burden, so these are diseases like diabetes, for example, where you're having to engage in medical care multiple times a day, tend to be more chronically stressful than other diseases that don't require such a level of daily maintenance or burden. Um, the next one is stress processing. And what that means is how we take stress into our brain and how we interpret it. So for example, we know that cardiomyopathy and other chronic illnesses are universally stressful, that's a given. But we also know that the more the person's brain perceives that as something that's terrible, typically the worse that they feel. So that's important information for us. The good thing about that is that those thoughts can be changed. When we talk about coping strategies, they tend to be categorized as either emotion focused, which means, for example, talking to a friend, expressing your feelings somehow, um, whereas problem focused strategies mean that you're doing something to try and solve the problem. There used to be a belief that problem focused strategies were better than emotion focused, but the, the research these days really suggests that it doesn't matter. There's really no one coping strategy that's better than the other but people tend to do better when they have more than one strategy in their arsenal. So essentially, if they're not doing the same kind of coping strategy for every situation, if they, have a, if they have some flexibility, they have some things that they might be able to choose from in a difficult situation. The other factor that can impact how children and families cope with chronic illness are personal factors. So factors inside themselves uh, of different individuals. So one of those is problem solving skills. People that are better at problem solving tend to have less anxiety and depression. However, the great news about that, especially for kids, is that these skills can be taught and often really can fairly quickly have a good impact on how kids are feeling. Um, the second is locus of control. And we're gonna talk a little bit about more about that later, um, which essentially is having a good sense of what what things are within your control and what things are not. We know with COVID, there are a lot of things that are not within our control. And that's something we're gonna talk again in more detail about later. Um, in terms of developmental status, we expect that younger children would cope differently with chronic illness than, te and than teenagers or older kids. So that's what that means. And then when we talk about pre-morbid psychological functioning, that means what your life was like or how you were doing psychologically before your illness. So if you had challenges before then, say you had difficulties with anxiety or depression or behavioral concerns, 
before you got diagnosed, you're at higher risk for continuing to have those problems after you got diagnosed. And somebody who did not have those concerns beforehand might be less likely afterwards. The next area that we think about, and the bigger one, is really social environmental factors that impact people, how people are doing. So these are factors outside of yourself. So one of those is family functioning. So the research suggests to us that families who are more cohesive, so who are experienced more closeness and have less conflict tend to do better. Their kids tend to do better or be less at risk for emotional difficulties than families that have more conflict or are more emotionally distant. Um, we also know that social support is certainly a big factor in how people cope with illness. Um, when we think about parental adjustment, um, parent, how parents are doing, how parents are coping has a big impact on how kids are doing. That's something that we, we probably all could have guessed. And then when we think about resources, this is an important one to consider. Families who have multiple stressors in their lives and less resources tend to have more difficulty coping with illness. And this makes a lot of sense. When you're worried about your family getting enough to eat, coping with illness tends to take a back seat. Um, it doesn't become as much of a priority. I want to spend a bit of time talking about the role of uncertainty. Um, uncertainty in disease, as I briefly mentioned before, is really a known significant predictor of distress in a chronic illness. And as we know, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with COVID-19. And families of children with cardiomyopathy, to some extent, are used to living with a certain degree of uncertainty, some more than others, depending on their child's condition. Um, but for families with kids with cardiomyopathy or with any chronic illness, there are extra worries associated with COVID-19. I'm sure there are others that I haven't even thought of, but these may include the particular vulnerability of their child to the impact of an infection, whether or not the recommended precautions for the general population are enough for their child, and whether or not it will be safe to return to school or for parents to return to work when it is deemed okay for the general public to do so. Do the same rules that apply to the general public, do they apply to kids and families with cardiomyopathy or with any type of chronic illness? And that not knowing that really magnifies uncertainty. I wanna shift gears now to talking a bit about some strategies for coping with COVID-19. I'm gonna focus more on parent coping and then talk at the end more so about some of the some of the things that we can do for our kids and woven within what we're talking about parents includes a lot of information about ways to help our children. So briefly when we think about general anxiety it's very different from COVID anxiety and one of those reasons is that COVID anxiety really covers so many different areas there are so many potential impacts of COVID as many people have experienced. One is the most obvious physical concerns, concerns about illness, um, emotional concerns. So how your child and your family will cope with quarantine, um, with anxiety about the illness. Many families are experiencing economic stressors from either less employment or loss of employment. Um, there are also social concerns associated with COVID from a social isolation to kids not having regular contact with the other children and teachers. Um, psychological concerns, we've seen a large increase in anxiety and depression during this time of quarantine with people in general, which is not surprising. And there's likely more areas of concern that we haven't even thought about. So when we think about starting to cope, what I want you to do is if you have a second, take a break and go grab a piece of paper and a pen. I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds to do that. One of the ways to start thinking about this is to take, kind of take a step back and to examine your values. So you might not know the answer to, the, to these questions that I'm gonna ask you by the end of this hour. Um, you may have some ideas, but this is something that it might be worthwhile to think about over time because your values, when you have a good sense of them, will, kind of, will help to guide your behavior and think about what priorities are most important to you during this time. So some of the questions that I want you to, to jot down some answers to are first, what sort of person do you want to be through this challenge? Secondly, what do you want to stand for? And third, what do you want your children to remember during this time? The answers to these questions are all very personal. 
So, and everybody has different values. So for some families, the value could be resilience. It's really important to demonstrate, it's really important for them to feel like and to demonstrate to their children that they can get through tough times. So that might be one value. Another family may be very focused on academic achievement. That might be something that's really important to them. So that's where they'll focus their energy and their priorities through this time. Other, might re other people might really value, for example, family closeness. And so they might prioritize spending time with your children or in their family or, or um, having more emotional connection during this time. Other people might really value flexibility or they might prioritize kindness or being a good neighbor. So there's lots of different potential values and it's a very, very personal process. So the next step is to start to revisit your expectations and priorities. And honestly, now that we're two months into this, I think naturally most of us have been doing this over time. So this can be whether it's your expectations for what homeschooling is gonna look like for your kids, what working from home might look like, um, what are the things that are most important and thinking about where you can cut corners. So this really varies depending on your family circumstances, let's just, such as your job situation, your kids' ages, how many kids you have, how independent they are or not. So trying to think about what's the most important and where you can cut corners can be really helpful and what you can prioritize. So for example, in my household, to get through schoolwork, it takes a really long time because there are a lot of, as many people have experienced, you get assignments from art and from gym in addition to regular classroom assignments. So one of the decisions that we made was we're gonna cut out all the specials, that we're just only gonna do the work that's required and needs to be handed in. My child's eight, so that might be different for a child that's younger or a child that's older, but the priority needed to be not spending lots and lots of time doing schoolwork, but doing what needed to be done. But it's different for every family. For some people, cleanliness is something that's just really important to them. Some people just can't function if their house isn't clean. So it might not be a realistic goal to loosen up your priorities about that. So a lot of people talk about, oh, you shouldn't worry about your house being messy, but if cleanliness is something that's really important to you, then that's something that you should prioritize. And then as a result of that, then you cut back in other areas to make room. So these are just examples of many possibilities. The next step is to really take those values and priorities and then to think about acting in alignment with them. When you act in accordance with your values, whatever they are, people tend to feel better. It's actually a scientifically proven fact that when people act in a manner that's consistent with who they are and what they believe in, they tend to feel better regardless of what's happening in the world around them. Again, we wanna acknowledge that this is a particularly universally stressful situation and everybody's gonna have some challenges. So we'd like to think about trying to choose your behaviors intentionally. So that means, you know, aligning what you do with who you want to be. So what aligning what you do with what your values are. So for example, if kindness is something that you identified as a value, then look for ways to offer kind actions. Helping out a neighbor, um, making phone calls to, to, to folks who are in nursing homes, even just demonstrating kindness in your family. If patience is a value, look for ways to model that in your family. I know that's easier said than done. And also I think you know, a really important piece of this is not to be afraid to self-correct. So, and this can be in big and small ways. We can't be perfect all the time, especially now. And I think we all started out in this process with the beginning of this with a lot of very high hopes. And we'll talk about that more later about everything that we were going to accomplish during this time what we were going to be during this time. And again, we can't be perfect all the time. And the ability to notice when we've made a mistake, to apologize for that, and then to shift gears accordingly is something really important we wanna teach our kids. I'll give you a personal example. Um, I don't wanna be a person that yells at my kid. Um, it never helps the situation, though in the moment, it always feels totally justified. I'm sure a number of people can relate to that but then I always end up regretting it afterwards. But we all get stressed and sometimes lose our tempers a little bit. And it's okay to then go back afterwards and say, I'm sorry, you know, I wish I hadn't yelled, 
um, I'm going to try better next time. And actually that helps. And it does make me less likely to do it better next time. And then kids see that we make mistakes and then we apologize and we learn and move on. So self-correcting is not only important for ourselves, but it's also an important thing to demonstrate for our kids. It's also important to know that your values and your priorities can change over time. So what felt important to you at the start of this pandemic may be very different from now or versus three months from now, because things are shifting all the time. And it's okay to shift those priorities as you and your family's needs change. So for example, an example I gave before, it felt really important to me at the start of this that my second grader complete all of his schoolwork. Any, it doesn't really seem that that's the most important thing anymore. And I think a lot of people felt that way, that it was just really important to keep up with schoolwork and soon discovered that that just was not a priority that they wanted to stick to. I think all, uh, we also had a lot of ideas about, many people did, about some of the things that we'd accomplished during our time, that we'd have more time at home than we really do, and that we would learn new things, that it would be time for our kids to learn new things. And honestly, sometimes the priority, particularly during this time, is really just muddling through. And that is okay, just getting through this time. The topic that I want to spend a lot of time talking about is this idea of control. Um, there are so many aspects to this particular situation with COVID-19 that us as individual people cannot control. Um, we can only control our own behavior, and sometimes that's even challenging. And when people try to over-organize over the things that you can't control is when they tend to feel anxious. And this is a big one. And in thinking about this, for me, differentiating in this, in this circumstance between what I can and can't control and trying to focus energy on the things that you can control has been particularly helpful. Um, I found this graphic on the next page to be one that was very useful for me in the start of this time. So if you look at it, you see that there are a lot of things that we cannot control that are happening related to this illness. Um, I, I, I'm imagining that a lot of you who have been on social media have seen how much time people spend on social media kind of freaking out about other people's behaviors, essentially what they're not doing in terms of social distancing. Unfortunately, that's one of the things that we can't control. We can only control how we follow social distancing recommendations and how our family does. We can't control anything other people do, to be honest. Um, we can't control what's going to happen in the future. And there's so much uncertainty about when we're gonna be able to return to school or will our kids be able to go to camp or what is going to be safe to do in the world. And we, we don't know what that's gonna be like several months from now. And trying to predict what will happen in the future can, make, it can lead to a lot of stress. Um, things that we can do, we can control how we access information. We can control how we follow recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control, for example. We can control our own behaviors and we can control our attitudes to the best we can, finding things to do at home, but we can't control how much toilet paper or paper towels there are at the grocery store and trying to think about letting go of the things that we can't control. I know it's easier said than done and really trying to focus on the things that we can control can make a big difference into the level of distress that we're feeling. I wanna talk about some, some strategies for managing those times where you're feeling acute stress related to the situation or honestly in general. We all have those moments during this time, even if we're generally doing well, where the stress level sneaks in and it can get overwhelming. The worry about all of those things that we can't control, it happens to all of us. For some people, it's when they're not being able to, they're not able to sleep in the middle of the night. For other people, it might be when they're just feeling overwhelmed during the day with lots of conflicting priorities. Um, so what do we do when that happens, when we're just feeling that acute level of stress to settle us down? So when a big storm blows up, the boats in the harbor drop anchor because if they don't, they'll get swept out to sea. And of course, dropping anchor does not make the storm go away. Anchors cannot control the weather, but it can hold a boat steady in the harbor until the storm passes in its own good time. So similarly for humans, 
in an ongoing crisis, we are all going to experience these emotional storms. Unhelpful thoughts spinning inside our head and painful feelings that, are, that might be whirling around our body. And if we get swept away by that storm inside us, there's really nothing effective that we can do. Um, it really kind of takes control of you in the moment. So the first practical step of the thing that you can do to help yourself is something that we call dropping anchor. So dropping anchor involves more or less three steps. The first one is just acknowledging your feelings. You're acknowledging that whatever is showing up in your mind, whether it's thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, um, sensations, you can kind of take the stance of, I like to think of it as like being a curious scientist, kind of observing what's going on in your, in your inner world. Um, this is somewhat similar to the ideas of mindfulness, where you're just really not, not judging any particular thoughts or feelings that are coming into your head. You're just noticing them. You're taking stock of them, noticing where you are right now and how you're feeling. And at the same time, while continuing to acknowledge those thoughts and feelings, using this opportunity to, to reconnect with your body, to know what's happening in your body. So notice any particular pains you might be having, feelings in your body, and then try and engage with your body. So that means it can be something as simple as pushing your feet hard into the floor. I know this stuff sounds kind of weird, but it actually can be really helpful in moments where you're experiencing that acute stress storm. So pushing your feet hard into the floor, stretching, uh, focusing on breathing very slowly and intentionally, anything that forces you to focus on a behavior in your body and helps to get you out of your head can be really, really helpful. One of the, the mindfulness strategies that people often recommend is something called five senses as a way to reorient yourself. So that involves listing, you know, wherever you are, focus on and identifying in your head, what are five things that I might be able to smell right now? five things that I can hear, five things that I can taste. You're not likely to be able to come up with five things for each of them. You know, five things that I can hear, five things that I can see, for example, five things that I can feel on my body, whether it's my feet on the ground, my rear end in the chair, whatever it might be. Doing that can be really helpful in the midst of an emotional crisis to just kind of settle yourself down for a moment. And then the focus is now to be engaged on the now, which means trying to reorient your behavior afterwards. It is really, really hard to change thoughts and feelings. I think that's something that we've learned in the world of psychology over time when we're thinking about types of therapy for people. Um, the focus used to be much more on changing your thoughts as a way to then change your feelings and your behavior. And now the, the focus is more on trying to change the behavior first, which then in turn helps to modify your thoughts and feelings. So one way to do that to is to really focus on what you can control. So choosing your behavior. So one of those things is to provide some degree of structure for you and your kids. And I, I say that it's important that this structure be flexible. So having some degree of a routine and schedule can be really helpful not a rigid routine. I think we all started out, and I'll show an example in a moment, of everybody in the beginning, many people tried to come up with very regimented routines for what their days were going to be, were going to look like, what their children's days were going to look like, and a pretty structured schedule. And we're learning over time that this really doesn't work. However, at the same time, some degree of routine and schedule, even if it's small things like getting up at the same time every day or get, immediately getting up and taking a shower, always eating lunch and dinner together, whatever it might be, even if it's just small things can make a big difference for families. Identifying separate space, if that's even possible, it's not always possible for all families and also establishing priorities for the day. So what is the most important thing for my child to accomplish in school today? What's the most important thing for me to accomplish at work? what's the most important thing for our families to accomplish and those can be really helpful instead of feeling like we tend to get overwhelmed by feeling like we have so many things that we need to do so as an example um, a lot of you probably saw this online as an example of a of an ideal and i, I say ideal in quotes COVID 19 daily schedule and i think many of us at least had big fancified ideas about what we we're going to be able to get our kids to do during this time. 
um, including time for academics and creativity and with just a tiny bit of free time, you know, very little screen time, getting chores done, quiet time, all these things we we're gonna do at this sort of relatively strict time frame. And I think we quickly learned that it took maybe a week or two for it to turn more into something like this, which is essentially trying to keep your kids alive while also working from home and praying they don't start fighting while I'm on a conference call. So times have, you know, times, our ideas about what would work really changed very quickly. And I think we, we came to quickly understand that a rigid structure was not something that was going to be helpful. The next part of focusing on what you can control and choosing your behavior is thinking about how to care for yourself and thinking about some self-compassion. So if you've ever flown on a plane, you've heard this message. In the event of an emergency, put on your own oxygen mask before assisting others. In this situation, self-kindness is really your own oxygen mask. If you need to look after others, which many of us do in life in general, but in particular during these circumstances, you'll do it a whole lot better if you're also taking good care of yourself. What is it that you need right now that might help you feel better when things are feeling challenging? Is it getting more exercise? Is it drinking more water? Is it eating different food? Is it time to yourself? Yes, we probably need all of those things. Um, some more rest, a nap, um, anything, getting out of the house. Sometimes identifying just one thing that you feel like you need, with social connection with other people, um, and making a plan for it to happen in a socially distant way, of course, can really make a big difference. So the other thing I would encourage you to do is to really ask yourself, you know, if somebody I loved was going through this experience, feeling what you're feeling, and you wanted to be kind and caring towards them, how would I treat them? What would you tell a friend if they were having a really tough time? How would I behave towards them? What would I do or what would I say? And really trying to treat yourself in the same way. This is a really hard time. And again, it's particularly hard time for parents of kids with chronic illnesses, and cardiomyopathy is no exception to that, and, and has its, its own unique stressors associated with it. It's really, really important to show yourself some compassion as you're trying to manage the many, many stressors and responsibilities during that time. And by doing that, you're also going to be modeling that for your child and will also make you, also make you better equipped to be able to care for your child. The next is identifying resources to access help and support. So there are a number of ways to do this. First is sort of your informal support. So who are the friend, so who are the friends that I can count on? Who are family, who are the family members that I can count on during this time? And that's not only for social support, but also for, you know, who do I, who do I need if I really am stuck in a situation and need some help? Thinking about how to connect socially. You know, for, for many families, as you know, the, sort of these Zoom happy hours or just having conversations over online over Zoom can be really, really helpful for people. Other people don't like it quite as much, but thinking about how, whether it might be a phone conversation or sending emails, what is a way that helps you feel more connected socially to other people in the way that makes you feel the most comfortable can be particularly helpful as a way to help support yourself emotionally during this time. Thinking about more formal resources for support. Um, the first one, which I wanna spend more time on is thinking about your sources of information about COVID-19 and about this time. There are, as you know, so many sources of information out there and so just as many of them are not accurate. Um, what I, I spend a lot of time in my work these days talking to kids and families about how to identify what is a reliable source of information and what kind of information to look for and what to stay away from. And the biggest recommendation that people have is really to look for the scientists, that you wanna get your information from scientists, in particular specialists, for example, in epidemiology and in infectious disease, microbiology, and look for the data. So it is very, very common that there are so many one-off stories in the media about a child who got sick from COVID-19 and had a really difficult illness or one crazy situation of somebody who was previously healthy and something terrible happened to them as a result. 
And it's very easy to get caught up in these in these individual stories and which then end up creating a lot of anxiety about what might happen to yourself and your family and your child. Where it's really, really important to take to try as much as you can is to focus on sources of information that give you the big picture. So looking at data from the Center for Disease Control, for example, or information that comes from scientists about what they're seeing and what the actual risks are and are not. And in the same way, trying not to look for, for people that are giving prognostication about the future. Looking at predictions about the future are not going to be tremendously helpful right now. Unfortunately, we don't really know what's going to happen in August or September or next December. And people are just making the best guesses they can. And when we hear all of that information, it tends to make people much more anxious. So for example, for me, I've really tried to stop listening to any information about what's gonna happen, say, past June, that I'm really trying to keep my focus on things one month at a time as a way of managing my own uncertainty about what lies ahead for, for school, for work, for being able to be outside in the world, for risk of infection, et cetera. Um, the next is one of the things that people do as a way of managing information is to really set a time limit each day or set an amount limit. So that's something that can be helpful. I know someone who sets a limit that she only looks at the news half an hour in the morning and half an hour at night. For me, that would be too much, to be honest with you. But for this person, it, it, before it had been so much. So for them, it's actually less than they were before. And that seems to be helpful. Um, focusing on you know knowing who your health professionals are. You all have your teams of people that you can go to for information and for advice as much as they know at this time about what you, your particular child and family should do to minimize risk. Um, having emergency services, knowing what to do in an emergency. Um, actually, the biggest problem right now that is happening with kids in, at least in the Philadelphia area, but I know this is happening across the country, is the bigger problem is not kids getting COVID infections, but kids not getting medical care that they need for a variety of other reasons because they're so worried about going to the hospital and that they would get sick in the hospital or at the doctor's office that they're actually neglecting other medical needs that they have. Um, having a plan for what would happen if somebody in your family got sick and needed to be quarantined. Who would take care of your children? How might you work out the distribution of responsibilities in your household. Having a general plan for that, but not focusing too much on the details can be helpful and can be comforting. So at least you know that you'll know what you would need to do if something happened. Um, also accessing mental health resources if you need them. And if you're feeling like you are having a level of anxiety or sadness that you feel like is not manageable. Um, and after this, I'm happy to talk to folks further offline if specific recommendations are needed or specific resources for individual support. So now that we've figured out how to start thinking about helping ourselves, we I want to talk a bit about attending specifically as we wrap up here to the needs of children. So the first is how do we give kids information? And the general recommendation that we have with regard to giving kids information really about anything that's happening in the world, in particular their own illnesses, is to give information in small amounts and at levels that kids can understand. And I think the tendency that we tend to do as adults is we tend to give kids too much information and sometimes it's more than what they're asking. So it's really important to give kids lots of opportunity to ask questions um, to provide fairly basic information and to continue to check in if they want more information, but not to provide too much if it's not a question that they're asking. Um, very often they are satisfied with the answer that they give and then we still have that tendency to just provide more. Um, I think it's really important to try and limit kids access to information on the news, for example, or in social media to the extent possible for older kids. I know that's more challenging. Um, but for younger kids. And I'll also, at the end, I have some links for good sources of information for kids about coronavirus, both on the web and in some books, and um, a link to a kids-focused town hall. So the things that kids really need right now during this time, the first is really increased love and attention. Attention can be hard. It's honestly easier said than done, especially when you're working all day, and you may have to meet the needs of 
multiple children or multiple other responsibilities. Um, but as much as we're able to do that, that can be particularly helpful. Providing listening, just listening to what kids' particular concerns or worries are, and kind reassurance about the areas where you can provide reassurance. And knowing that your family has a plan for what they'll do if something happens can be really reassuring for kids, more so than providing sort of blanket false reassurance of, oh, everything's going to be okay. But instead to say, you know what, if this gets, if this happens, we will do X, Y, and Z. Or if we have a question that we can't answer, we will go to the doctor and ask the doctor that question. Um, kids really need opportunities to play. And I think we're learning that that's really more important than a strict schedule or the strict schedule that we envisioned in the beginning of this. And in the same way, they need some, some access to downtime, but also some degree of structure and routine. Even though I, you know, I talked quite a bit about how, how having a really rigid structure isn't helpful, having some degree of routine, even if it's something as simple as your kid goes to bed the same time every night, or you always have meals at the same time, you know, having some degree of routine that's somewhat similar to what you had before really helps kids, for kids, especially younger kids, provide some degree of safety and security, that they know that some things in the world are consistent and still happening the way that they happened before especially, and that's unique to every individual family as to what that particular routine that you might want to keep in place is. For some families, bedtime works really, keeping bedtime the same works well. For other families, that's just not manageable and something else might be, keeping some other degree of structure might be the same. I think honestly, it's the same for screen time. We've all had to relax our screen time rules or our screen time ideals during this time. And you know what works best for your child and family. Some children do okay with, a lot of screen time and some kids really have a hard time with that and I think you know your kid well enough to know what seems to work well and not so you're likely going to need to relax your rules for screen time but it's also okay to limit that if that's something that ends up being more challenging for your child um, providing kids with clear and concrete facts and information and again like I mentioned before limiting their exposure to information um, and I'm gonna what I'll do on this next page is talk to you a little bit about some resources that I have here um, for kids. So the first one, and these are all links that I'm hoping will be available uh, by the website. Um, if not, I'll make sure that we're able to figure out how to get you access to this. So the first one is um, a resource from the hospital that I work at, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, that just gives some general tips to talking with kids about COVID-19, about coronavirus. The second is it's amazing how quickly that people have produced books in multiple languages actually that are written for kids of different ages to help them understand the coronavirus in a way that's that's at a, an appropriate developmental level for kids. So there's a, I put up just a couple of the, actually several books that are out there in English. And then also there's, I found a book for children in Spanish that can be helpful for Spanish speaking families. And the last one is, some of you may have heard about this, but there was a CNN put on a coronavirus town hall for kids. This was probably about two or three weeks ago at this point, and it featured some scientists, including a psychiatrist from CHOP, um, and also featured all of kids' favorite Sesame Street characters. Elmo, Elmo fared fairly prominently in that and did a really nice job, I think, of collecting questions from kids around the country about what they wondered and were worried about and provided information in a fun, digestible, and appropriately reassuring way to kids about coronavirus and what they can do and what they can't do and who they can ask for more information. So these are some links that we'll figure out a way that we can, we can be sure to get to you. And the next thing is just thinking about what our new normal is going to look like. And maybe this is something that it's going to look like having to get a reservation to go to the beach. Um, we have hopefully have a lot of things to be hopeful for for the future. Um, and I'm hopeful that some of the strategies that we talked about today will help people to just tide the storm and in the way to getting there. Um, we now have some time for some questions if anybody has questions. Okay, um, yep, we do have a couple of questions, but before I get to that, um, I, I just want to let everyone know that um, I will get the resources from Dr. Lefkowitz and I will make sure that we email any of those resources uh, out to everyone uh, in the webinar so that you have the actual resources 
um, that Dr. Uh, Lefkowitz um, shared with us. Um, so we have a couple of questions and uh, please, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to um, type them in on the control panel. Um, the first one is, my 12 year old daughter and family have been coping uh, during COVID-19 outbreak well, despite quarantine. Uh, we feel as though everyone is in the same boat, staying home, social distancing, et cetera. Um, if school should open in September and with new research linking COVID to pediatric disease, my anxiety is kicking in and mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid I will be fearful to send my daughter to school. Um, so this is a two part question. How do I, how do I manage my fear if I, and if I do decide to keep my daughter home, how do I, how do I tell her? So the, that's an excellent question. And I think this is something that many, many people are worried about. So you're certainly not alone, um, particularly, and particularly families of kids with cardiomyopathy or other chronic illnesses is what do I do about returning my child to school? If everybody else is going back to school, how do I make that decision? And I, th and how do you manage your anxiety about that decision? And the first thing I would do is um, rec I, was, I would recommend that when the time comes, when the schools make that decision to really talk to your doctor, you know, talk to your cardiologist, talk to your PC, your child's cardiologist, PCC, to try and get some information from them or some guidance from them about what they recommend to be the risks or not the risks and what they recommend that you do. They're not gonna give you a definitive answer. They're unfortunately, they are gonna allow families to make their own decisions but to give you some, some information about that, what might be helpful. Um, secondly, I think when you tell your daughter, I think it also depends on what you're telling her, but I think having that recommendation come from the medical team might be something that might make it a little bit easier to swallow. My, my guess, to be honest with you, is that schools are going to go move into some kind of sort of a hybrid situation where there are pretty strict social distancing rules within the school setting, but there also is likely to be a component of online learning. So although it's really hard to predict what, what is actually gonna happen within each individual school district, it's hard to know what to tell your daughter until that situation happens. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so this is not about COVID. This is, um, my five-year-old son has a difficult time with any type of medical procedures. His behaviors are become challenging, and while I understand his fears, um, how do I manage his behaviors, and um, how can I talk to him to help him through those situations? Those are really, really, really good questions and really big questions. Um, mm -hmm. That's you're you're uh, you're not the only one who has a five. You know, lots of five year olds have a really hard time. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more offline about that. I think that might be helpful to give you some resources, but the other things that I would recommend of if there is a child life specialist in the hospital where your child is getting care, they can be particularly helpful in thinking about how to provide information to, to kids at their developmentally appropriate age, so how to talk to a five-year-old about what's going to happen. Um, and then also sometimes it can be really helpful to work even briefly with a psychologist or somebody else who has experience in working with kids who have to come to the hospital for repeated medical experiences, just to help learn some strategies for coping and managing that anxiety. And I'd be happy to talk to you about resources after this. Okay. Um, and then the last is, what is the best way to tell a 15 year old about their disease and the limitations that they may face? I'm a, personally, I'm a big fan of being honest. Um, but the so not providing information that's not accurate, not trying to sugarcoat it, but also letting that trying to go along with the questions that they're asking. So providing some fairly basic information, and then you know without knowing the specifics, it's hard to know exactly what to say or not to say. But in general, I recommend you know, providing basic information, asking the answering the questions that your child asks. And then also really encouraging them to ask the medical team and to be an active partner in their medical care, you know, by asking questions of the doctors and nurses themselves as much as they feel comfortable to try and get that information. I, what I often find is that parents often try to shield information from kids, mm -hmm. which tends to make things worse in the long run, even if you feel like you're protecting them at the time. 
um, for a 15 year old, it's probably also going to be really important to help them to know what appropriate information. I don't know if this 15 year old is an information seeker and would tend to look stuff up on the internet or not. But I think with most 15 year olds, it's probably really important to also have that conversation about how to access reliable information out there. Because what's out there can tend to be more scary than what may may not apply to them or might not be relevant. Um, so that's an, a very important piece of that. Okay. But the general principle being that honesty is the best policy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions we have. Um, so I, I want to thank you, Dr. Lefkowitz, for sharing your time and expertise. We um, This was a great webinar. Um, I've learned a lot, and I think our audience did as well. Um, so I, I just want to um, tell everyone thank you for coming. Thank everyone for being part of this. Um, uh, thank Dr. Lefkowitz for giving her time. Um, if you want to learn more about the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, we encourage you to go to our website um, to learn about us and the resources that we have. Um, it's www.childrenscardiomyopathy.org. Um, and also, I just want to remind everyone that today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, and it's CCF Heart Kids. It's all one word. Um, so if there's anything that you missed or you want to listen to um, the presentation again, you can go there. It will probably be up tomorrow. Um, and um, I will make sure that everyone gets the resources that um, were spoken about during the presentation uh, for kids, um, and I will send those out to everyone tomorrow. So that's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great Thank night, you. and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.